So I know some people can't even get through Capital Volume 1 once, but I actually would like to read it again now having read 2 and 3. And so I'm wondering what you think, if one was going to return to Volume 1 after reading these volumes, should we read for something different? Um, are there different chapters we should really focus on, or is there something new we would see in Volume 1? I think you would uh, uh, appreciate far more the uh, third chapter, which uh, is the famous chapter on money, which most people stumble over when they first <laughs> read Volume 1 of Capital. They have a hard time with it. But having read uh, Volume 2, I think you could go back and read volume, you know, Chapter 3 of Volume 1, and it would be a breeze. If you've got through Volume 2, I'll have a great time reading uh, <laughs> chapter three of uh, volume one. But I, I think that, again, I would, I would read it more for the contrasts mm -hmm. and ask yourself the question of what happens when, for example, uh, you insert uh, technological change into, into volume two, mm -hmm. which is excluded. What would happen? And, and so I, I would tend to read it that way. I wouldn't read it kind of saying, well, OK, I now read volume one differently. I think you would, uh, like in chapter three, you would, you would get a bit deeper appreciation of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think also there's a sort of a parallel. I don't know if you notice it. I mean, chapter 23 of volume one is called Simple Reproduction. Mm -hmm. And chapter 20 in volume two is called Simple Reproduction. So it's very interesting to read those two side by side. And, and actually, I think it's more helpful to volume two to do that, because in volume one, what Marx makes clear that this is not simply a technical matter, mm -hmm. that simple reproduction is about the reproduction of the class relation between capital and labor. Mm -hmm. And that tends to disappear a little bit in volume two. It becomes a technical kind of question. Mm -hmm. And so if you read the, the simple reproduction chapter in volume two with the idea that this is really about the reproduction of the class relation. Mm -hmm. Then I think you kind of have a rather deeper appreciation of what's in, in, in volume two. So I think there are some moments of, of, of that sort. Mm -hmm. But for me, the, the big issue is, is the contrast. Mm -hmm. That in volume two, the workers are getting more and more impoverished, whereas in volume three, you start to see this kind of question of workers' consumption mm -hmm. coming into the picture as a sort of a thing we have to maintain at a certain level in order for the equilibrium of the total organization of a capitalist society to, to, to work. So I would, I would read it more for the, for the contrasts than for kind of supportive, deeper insights, although the, they, those can be had. OK, well, uh, you finished volume two, right? Time just to celebrate so we can go out and party. <laughs> I think uh, I wanted to use this uh, session so you could uh, ask uh, general questions uh, about what's going on in volume two, and any specific kind of questions that are still uh, muddling you. But I, but I thought I'd start off by, by, by reminding you a bit of the uh, framework that I started out with from the Grundrisse, in which um, I suggested Marx sort of distinguishes these different levels, uh, the universal, which is the relation to nature, the metabolic relation to nature. And that is a sphere of natural law. And that does not make very much of an appearance in Capital uh, as a book, but this level of, of universality is not really Marx's main interest. Then is the level of generality, which is uh, the question of laws of, na of motion, of capital. And this is uh, law-like. Law and, and I think uh, it's fairly clear that throughout capital Marx is concentrating on the laws of motion of capital, which is really proceeding at this level. Then there is the level of particularity, which is uh, not law-like, it's conjunctural and accidental. 
And here we're dealing with uh, questions of distribution. Uh, the categories of uh, interest, rent, uh, taxes, uh, profit on merchants' capital, and all the rest of it. And of course, distribution is also about wages and also about profit rates. So this is, uh, th this is accidental. and conjunctural. And this particularity also goes to the realm of market exchange, the actual dynamics of market exchange. Uh, and, and here we will be looking very specifically at in particular two, two elements which are very significant here is Marx's treatment of supply and demand and, and also competition versus monopoly, so the state of competition. And throughout capital Marx tends to sort of uh, invoke them every now and again uh, but then not do anything with them, so they're really outside of my purview. And then there's the realm of singularity, uh, which is uh, largely the realm of consumption, and, and this is uh, uh, not accidental and conjunctural, it's really chaotic and unpredictable. as any singularity would be. Now I think uh, you would probably agree with me, after reading volume two of Capital, uh, you would say there's very little about singularity in the realm of consumption except insofar as both the bourgeoisie and the workers have to consume. So at a certain point, but how they consume and all the rest of it is left to one side. Uh, the particularities are not taken up either. Uh, so this is the level at which Marx works in volume two of Capital right the way uh, throughout. Now, when he presented this kind of schema in uh, the Grundrisse, well, I think Marx also did at the end is to say, if you want to understand society as a totality, you have to think about all of these elements moving together. That is, you have these, uses the imaginary of an organic totality, well it's, or it's not organic in the sense of a, a tight organic, it's sort of more like an ecological organism, in which all of these elements are, are working together, which then immediately raises uh, the question, you know, what's the relationship between what Marx is discovering about the laws of motion of capital at the level of generality, what's the relationship of that to history? And as I think I pointed out in the first lecture, on the first page of volume one of Capital, Marx says, uh, to discover the uses of things is the work of history suggesting that there's something over there called history, a body of inquiry called history, and a body of inquiry over here called political economy, and he's going to do the political economy, and the history is to be done somewhere else. So one of the questions which this poses then is what's the relationship between these laws of motion which he's set up and the actual historical dynamic in which we find ourselves? And I think uh, theoretically, immediately, you would say, well, you can't actually explain everything going on around us right now simply by appeal to the world of generality. Uh, you have to actually invoke all of these other elements. And if you look at Marx's work and you say, well, what kind of theory of consumerism is there in Marx? The answer is it's not there at all. Uh, except that, you know, in order to, to reach equilibrium, the workers have to consume this amount of value and the bourgeoisie that amount of value. So it's just simply uh, an aggregate uh, consumption 
But given that consumerism is a very important driver of any economy, 70% of the US economy is driven by consumerism, then obviously you wouldn't say, well, we can only appeal to the general laws of motion to understand what's going on. And given that there's been a crash in financial markets, which obviously involves questions of distribution around interest and, and all the rest of it, so the relationship to history is, is I think, a very particular one which you have to think about. And that then poses a, a, a sort of interesting problem of how do you think about each one of these in relationship to these general laws of motion that Marx has uh, discovered. Uh, how, for example, do you relate singular, the singular behaviours of consumers to these general laws of motion? And, and what would it mean if you tried to put them into a relationship? And I thought I'd use myself as a, a singularity uh, with some cer certain crazy kind of uh, consumer habits and then try to locate it in relationship to the generality of accumulation so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the things I have an intense passion for is English bitter marmalade. <laughs> now you can either say that this is something that arose out of some genetic defect <laughs> Or you can say, well, it came from somewhere, where did it, where did it come from? Now, I, when, I, when I went back to live in Britain for six years at the end of the 1980s, I got used every January to making my own marmalade. Before that I'd been satisfied with this stuff that came in pots and flashy labels, but after I got used to making my own mar marmalade, I, I couldn't stand that stuff. So when I came back to the United States in 1993, thereafter, every year I would somehow or other manage it that I would go to Europe, somewhere in Europe, uh, either Britain or France, and I'd go and make marmalade. And I once met uh, the, you know, the, the, he was a provost then, now president of the Grad Centre, uh, and he said, oh, I'm going to be in Paris in January. I said, oh, I'll be there, let's meet. And so we met and we had a drink. And he says, well, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came here to make marmalade. And he kind of looked at me as if, what kind of crazy nutter have I got on my faculty? You don't make the marmalade, you make the, the pulp, and I make the marmalade back here, but you, you make the pulp there. So I, I would do this every year. And about four or five years ago, uh, I engineered, uh, I really did engineer it, to uh, a visit to Cordoba in Spain. Well, if you know Cordoba, Cordoba is a very beautiful city and has an incredible mosque in the middle, and, and it has a, a, a fantastic uh, sort of Islamic style garden. Uh, in, the, in the midst of which there are all these orange trees, which have full of all of these luscious kind of bitter oranges. So I'm there for a conference and I took an afternoon off and I went and I went and picked all these oranges off the trees and, the, and I thought this is fantastic, you know, this stuff out of, you know, really out of Cordoba directly. Took them back to the hotel and what you have to do is you have to squeeze the juice out and you have to cut the pulp out and then you chop up all the stuff and I'm in the hotel doing all of this, you know, and I, I have big cartons full of the pulp, you know, and it's all going well until all of a sudden the door opens and the woman comes in and screams and it's the housemaid. It's a very acrid smell, I mean, it really is very acrid. So she screams and looks at me and I come out and I try to explain to her what I'm doing, my execrable Spanish, and she looks at me like I'm a total madman and stares at me and, and, and in the end just turns around, marched out there and slammed the door. And I, I got scared because I thought, well, she's going to go to the management and say, there's a madman up there, throw this guy out, you know. <laughs> and, you know, there's all these you know, pulp around all over the place, you know, it's kind of a real mess. Uh, nothing happened, actually, of that sort. The only thing that happened was I didn't get my bed made for three days, but <laughs> that, that, was, that was it. So I'm, all I'm doing here is to try to indicate how singular my behaviour is around, around marmalade. So how can you predict this from volumes one and two of Capital is the real interesting question. Well, actually, there's a way to do it. And it goes like this, that uh, actually when I was doing my dissertation uh, on 19th century uh, agriculture in Kent, there were two main crops that were being grown in the region. One was hops, which means I can always go on about brewing, as you've already heard. Uh, and I can also go on about uh, fruit production, which is the other main crop. And one of the things I did for my dissertation was I read the local newspaper from every issue, from 1815 to 1875. But one of the things I found was very interesting. In the 1840s I suddenly started to get reports on meetings of local agricultural societies. And the reports got longer and longer and more vigorous and huge debates going on. 
And at some of these meetings in mid-Kent, there were representatives of the West Indian sh sugar planters, plantation owners, who were, who, were, who were being invited. And one of the things that was going on was an alliance was building between the mid-Kent agricultural interest, the yeoman farmers, the independent farmers, and, and the plantation owners in uh, the West Indies over the question of the sugar duties. That is, they wanted to reduce the sugar duties. They wanted to get rid of them. And of course, they were immediately then in, in contact also with the Manchester interest, who were into the repeal of the Corn Laws, which is the laws on imported wheat. And if you remember from Volume 1, uh, there was uh, a real push by the manufacturing interest to go for free trade on agricultural produce so that you could lower the value of labour power. So if the price of bread went down, then you could pay fewer wages. Well, also you have to put something on the bread. Uh, and, you know, conserves and, 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 and jams and things like that are part, became part and parcel of that. Now, there's another side to this, which was when I was at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, one of my colleagues in anthropology is a man called Sidney Mintz, who wrote a fabulous book called uh, Sweetness and Power, which was about the West Indian sugar planters. But what Sid did, which is rather unusual for an an anthropologists at the time, is to say, you have to look at not only what the sugar planters are doing, but what's happening to the sugar when it goes, you know. And what's it doing in Britain? Well, what's it doing? what it was doing in Britain was, uh, again, the industrial interest was very concerned about trying to find some way to, you know, provide a, a kind of instant energy to workers in the, in the, in the mines and, and in the factories. And of course sugar is an instant form of, 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 of energy. And, and so there came this whole kind of notion in, in, in British working class of the tea break, where you get a big mug of tea and it's full of sugar, you know. Uh, and, and that gave people the energy to, 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 to sort of uh, go on. Well, there's a lot of sugar, a tremendous amount of sugar, in conserves and jams. Uh, also vitamin C. So there's kind of, was the, the, so the whole kind of diet of the British English working, the English working class was very much around uh, high sugar intake uh, and, and uh, you know, so, so in, a, in a way uh, all of this agitation in mid-Kent in the mid-19th century was very much about, you know, uh, all of the general agitation that was going on in Britain at the time over uh, the cost of reproduction of labour power and the value of labour power and the nature of working class diets which was going to give instant energy so that people could continue you know, down in the mines and down in the factories and all those kinds of things. So, in a sense, by thinking about volume one, you can see where, if you like, the whole kind of conserve and, 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 and other and, and jam industries coming from. But then there's another fact, which is you know, the, the, the jam makers had a problem. I mean, what they would typically do was they would harvest a lot of the fruit in, you know, June, July, August, this kind of stuff, and then they would make it into pulp and this kind of stuff, and then they'd make jam over time. By the time they got to about Christmas time, there was, the, what were you going to what were you going to use your fixed capital for? So the jam industry had a problem of about six months of the year it had nothing to make, it had no raw materials. Until some nutty Englishman like me went down to Spain, saw all of these oranges lying around, nobody using them because this, you know, they're, 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 they're bitter and, and horrible. And, and actually the reason they are that is because uh, the Spanish like the orange blossom. But, got, but didn't like the idea of people scrambling over the trees to get the actual fruit, so you, you, you have a fruit that, that, you, that, that can't, be, can't be eaten, you know. And uh, you know, this, probably some Englishman went down there and kind of said, my God, all this stuff's lying around here, it lies around here, and it comes to maturity in January, why don't we scoop it all up and take it back and put it in the... <laughs> so actually keeping the fixed capital fully employed, as you'll know from Volume 2, uh, became a very significant aspect of what was going on in the jam industry, and of course from about from about December to, to June, uh, the same factories that were making you know, raspberry jam and strawberry jams in, in one half of the year were making marmalade, bitter marmalade, which means we had to get the taste of bitter marmalade. So that became very much part of working class diets. And after a while, at Jan come January time, working class families typically started to make their own jams. My grandmother made jam, you know, made, made, the, made marmalade, my mother made marmalade, and, 
And it was very interesting for me when I was back there, I was making marmalade and I would start talking to my colleagues, well my colleagues are making marmalade, so we used to have these marmalade tasting ses sessions about, you know, who has the best marmalade. So the point about this is that actually my taste in marmalade has its roots in Volumes 1 and Volumes 2. <laughs> okay? Now if I say this, somebody's bound to take this seriously and say, ah, you see, what you're doing is you're turning everybody into an automaton where all they do is sort of uh, actually not having read volume, but secretly they've been manipulated so that they become sort of little atoms of, uh, you know, capital of circulation through, you know, all explained in Volumes 1 and Volume 2. Well, it's not like that at all, actually. Because what I think is, 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 is going on here is a very interesting formulation which we got out of Volume 3 in particular, and I, uh, we pointed, pointed this out a bit and I, I go back to it, one of the things, it's a striking phrase, where Marx talks about the way in which things can be autonomous and independent but subservient. And I think this is a very, very important concept in Marx. And I think it's very important to, 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 to have this sort of up front, that that's what he's saying. And I think autonomous and independent but subservient. And the way this would work would be, uh, the, the, the way I would, I would do a parallel in physical terms would be this, that, that, you know, we can walk around however we want, this way, that way and so on, and, but if you come to a cliff and you just keep on walking, then the law of gravity is going to take over and you're soon, you're soon going to find yourself subservient to the law of gravity with very uncomfortable uh, consequences. So yes, we're autonomous and independent, but you cannot ignore the cliff and, and, and the law of gravity. And I think the economy can be looked at in much the same way. That actually we're autonomous and independent, we can do all kinds of things, but you never know when you're going to hit it, you know, when there's a cliff and you step over the cliff and crash, you're on skid row. You know, I mean, it's, it's, this is, this is, if you like, the logic that seems that Marx is, 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 is purveying. The only difference, I think, between the physical kind of uh, situation and, and, and uh, the laws of motion of capital is the laws of motion of capital are changing all of the time. Whereas, you know, laws of physics, at least in our lifetime, remain the same and presumably have remained the same throughout the history of the universe, although there's some controversy over that, but, but, but you know, they're, they're, they're fairly constant, whereas the laws of motion of capital are constantly in, in ev evolving. And I suppose the only physical analogy of this would be something like, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, somebody's sitting contentedly on their patio sipping mint juleps on a nice sunny afternoon and then all of a sudden uh, the house disappears down a sinkhole. Um, now I got this image from a TV ad the other day where it, 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 it was kind of trying to persuade you that in order, if you, when you buy a house you should go through your friendly real estate agent because they are knowledgeable and, 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 and the ad has a couple of people looking very happy at their, their dream house and then all of a sudden it does indeed some, you know, <laughs> slide down into the earth and, and, and so they, their faces go from sort of smiling happily and then they kind of look horrified. Well, you know, um, that's like uh, moving into a neighbourhood where you think the values are stable and then all of a sudden the bottom goes out of the housing market and suddenly you find the savings that you thought you were going to get on the house become valueless. I thought it was a very nice metaphor. Now you can go back to your friendly real estate agent and, tell, and so ask the question, how come you didn't tell me all, all the value of this thing was going to go through the floor? Like, you know, but it, obviously by then they're long gone and have earned their commissions. But, but I think that that this is the way in which Marx is thinking about the relationship between singularities and generalities. That there are certain things, you know, a lot of things we can do and, or, and be very autonomous and, and independent and so on, but there are clear boundaries and barriers and, and, and you have to be careful when you, when, when, you, when you hit them. So Marx's point is not to say that, that this determines everything that happens here, that's not, not it, but what it's saying is setting up certain conditions which are going to have, uh, I think, a huge Im impact uh, if you start to try to, to go beyond what those conditions will bear. So his point in, in trying to set up these laws of motion is not to uh, say, you know, uh, have a deterministic theory of how society evolves. In fact, his historical writings are not deterministic at all. Uh, they're very voluntaristic, there's a lot of motion, there's a lot of, you know, class struggle is going on. Uh, 
Uh, a lot of crazy things happen uh, just individually. Uh, in the 18th Brumaire you get a strange character like uh, Louis Bonaparte who suddenly becomes an emperor and, and declares himself, and, well this is, this, is the, this is the world of singularity and contingency and accident and all the rest of it, and, and Marx is perfectly at home with that and kind of says, you know, this is, this is, this is fine. Uh, and I wouldn't expect history to be anything other than that, but history nevertheless does contain these sorts of dynamics, some of which we do pick up uh, as, as we go through Capital. Now, one of the big differences between Volume 1 and Volume 2, of course, is this, that in Volume 1 Marx arrives at an abstract concept, like surplus value, absolute surplus value, and then says, what this means is the, the, the worker is going to have to work more hours in the day than it really takes to reproduce the value of their labour power. So you get this concept, and then Marx kind of says, now historically of course there's therefore been a struggle over the length of the working day, and so you get a long historical chapter on the length of the working day, which makes a lot of sense of the theory of, of absolute surplus value. The same thing happens with the theory of relative surplus value, which is technological and organisational change. Marx sets up a theory which explains how that is crucial to the way in which capitalists uh, expand their capacity to, to gain surplus value. And then of course come three chapters on cooperation, division of labour and, and machinery and everything, which a huge amount of historical information is embedded, so you can make sense of the theory of relative surplus value simply by all of that historical information which Marx loads onto it. The same thing happens in the next segment of, of Volume 1 where he's talking about re the, the sort of reproduction process, capital accumulation, and then the general law of capital accumulation which produces uh, an industrial reserve army. So what do you get? You then get a long historical thing about the conditions of the industrial reserve army. So in Volume 1 it seems that every time you get to a major conceptual kind of configuration, Marx then fills it with historical information, historical meaning. He doesn't do any of that in Volume 2 at all. And, and that makes it, I think, extremely difficult uh, when we're first reading it to figure out what the historical meaning might be. And actually some of what goes on in Volume 2 is very hard to treat that way. For instance, the, the, the first four chapters that deal with you know, the, the circuit of money capital and, and commodity capital and productive capital and, and then puts it all together, that's very difficult to sort of put together with a, a sort of clear historical or, uh, meaning in the same way that you could with, say, the length of the working day uh, and the notion of absolute surplus value in Volume 1. And I think the same thing uh, applies also to the reproduction schemas at the end, which are very abstract and, 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 and far, far from being a model of an active, actual economy, so you have to kind of intuit what's going on there without any kind of help from the historical uh, record. Where he could have done, I think, uh, a much better historical job is over things like turnover time and fixed capital formation. You could imagine a, 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 a really interesting chapter on on the changing temporality of capital uh, over historical time and what it's about. You could imagine uh, something more, much more concrete on, on, on fixed capital, particularly fixed capital in the built environment and, and all those sorts of things. So there was a, a lot of historical possibility in the middle of, of Volume 2 that Marx never, uh, never took up and I think in some ways it's a pity he didn't. But what this does is, 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 is to leave us uh, with the problem of, of A, filling in a lot of the historical meaning for ourselves, but secondly also seeing what the relationship is of the generalities that are being, which are being constructed in Volume 2 and, if you like, the totality of what's going on in an existing society. And this is quite a substantial task and it's the sort of thing where, you know, after one, you know, one semester just reading Volume 2 of Capital, you just uh, can't go out and kind of go plonk, here it is, you know, it takes, I think, quite a, lot of, quite a lot of work. But some work has been done along those lines, including by myself, you know, on terms of, you know, things like, you know, the construction of built environments and, and, and the dynamics of temp spatio-temporality under capitalism and so on. So there, there is work which, which exists uh, which, which is, I think, illustrative of, of what's going on in, 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 in Volume 2, but it's not in the text, so you don't, 
so it's very, you know, very difficult, like I say, to see immediately from the text what the relevance of, of all of this uh, is, is going to be about. So I think the, when, when you reflect back on, on volume two, what you will see is a lot of propositions at this level of generality. And, and I think uh, some of the propositions are, are, are very interesting. <laughs> Uh, and what I, one of the reasons I thought it significant, and you know, it's still probably a matter of uh, debate as to whether it was a good thing to do or not, is by bringing in some of the more concrete stuff about merchants' capital and, and money capital, you can then start to see some of the historical context in which some of this would make sense. But of course, when you get into that, also, you're then abandoning the level of generality and you're getting into this realm of particularity. And as uh, you will remember, the interest rate uh, is determined not, not by, quote, the value of money, but it's set by market exchange conditions, i.e. supply and demand, and also by the state of competition. So many of the things that he ruled out of the world of generality suddenly come into this. One final point I'd like to, 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 to make a, a, about that. One of the things I, th I think I see more clearly happening in Volume 2 than I uh, had seen before was that Volume 2 provides, I think, a very solid rationale as to why you have to have a credit system. Again and again, in, in Volume 2, he invokes the credit system. And if you put it all together, you see that if capital did not have a, a, a functioning credit system, it probably would have jammed up over the question of hoarding. Now, it's very interesting, I was sort of looking back a little bit and sort of saying, how many times does Marx mention hoarding in Volume 2? The answer is, a lot. <laughs> okay. It's there all the time. He says, well, in order to do this, the capitalist has to hoard. Now, they're not hoarding you know, in Volume 1, Marx talks about hoarding as kind of, well, that's what misers do. Uh, but then he says, but there is a rational form of, of hoarding which capitalists have to do. But it's not very well developed in, in Volume 1 at all. But here you see rational reasons why capitalists have to hoard. With their fixed capital formation, they have to, have to save money and, 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 and put it in their pocket, as it were, until they replace the fixed capital. And then they need to go, you know, dealing with these different turnover times and all that sort of thing, you need to hoard. So hoarding comes up again and again and again. And hoarding, from the capitalist standpoint, is bad. So that therefore there is a necessity to overcome it. And you could imagine if there was not a credit system, so much capital would have to be hoarded relative to that which is used, that the system would jam up and stop. So, that I, so, so one of the things that comes out of this is, is I think, a, an, an impelling necessity uh, to mobilize credit and mobilize the credit system. And, and I think that, that actually to the degree that Marx wrote Volume 2 as, at the end of his life, and at the end of the analysis, uh, it, it seems to me he's discovering something himself about the rationale for the, for the credit system. And if that rationale is as strong as it, as it seems to be when you go back over Volume 2 and, and look at it, if that is as strong as it is, then this idea that somehow or other you can keep the world of particularity out of the generality <laughs> starts to break down. And I think that actually at this point you kind of go, well, maybe we have to loosen up particularly this, this distinction, over, over, and particularly over interest rate. I mean, you still might be able to leave taxes and, other, and rent and all of that aside, but you can't do it, uh, you, really can't, you really can't leave aside uh, the whole question of, of, of the credit system. If Volume 2 is, is, is pointing in the direction I, th I think it is. I mean, there's a couple of times when Marx says in here, uh, well, this grounds the credit system. 
And, and so I think that this is, this is, I think, one of the important things that came out, for me anyway, about reading volume two in, in this intense way this time, which, as I say, actually challenges the simplicity of this framework. Now, I, I don't think that Marx would be terribly upset about that framework being challenged. In other words, he wouldn't kind of say, oh, that's, you know, because one of the things he's very good at is being very fluid in the way in which he uses concepts. So, for example, fixed capital. You remember the definition of fixed capital, it's not a thing, it's not defined in terms of its thing qualities, it's defined in terms of its relation to production. So, I, I think I use the example of kind of saying, well, when a factory uh, is abandoned and it's turned into a condominium, it ceases to be fixed capital and becomes part of the consumption fund. But by the same token, if you have microfinance going in and people are starting to use their huts as, as uh, places to you know, spin artisanal clothing or something, then their hut is being turned into fixed capital. So fixed capital is defined by a specific use and a specific positionality. So he's very fluid about that. And he clearly says in that Grundrisse passage, he says, well, there are times when consumption enters into the generality. So it's not as if he's in principle kind of got rigid boundaries here. I think he would be prepared to relax them. But as you relax those boundaries which he's, he's, he's imposed, then you start to get a rather different kind of theoretical perspective. And again, to me, one of the crucial ones is, of course, the relationship between, between the general laws of capital accumulation and the, the dynamics of, the, of, 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 of credit and, and, and finance. So that's what I wanted to say a bit in way of introduction, but I, I know that some of you have some very specific questions, and when I was talking with some of you earlier in the week, I suggested that you bring some of those questions here. So, I don't know who wants to start. Manav, do you want to start? One of the things I was thinking about was um, in what ways this scheme here maps on the question of social reproduction. Yeah. So, um, I had a hard time sort of thinking about it in volume two as just those acts of working class consumption, um, but rather absolutely tied into of course, the level of uh, general generality, but right. so part of your explanation earlier, I think, satisfies me. But um, but I just I, it's just like an absolute absent dynamic in the whole yeah in the whole work. Yeah, I mean, when I was writing about this before in the uh, limits to capital, the uh, final chapter of limits to capital, I, I kind of said uh, you know I said look, there are two things that are missing here. One is a consolidated and coherent theory of state interventions and how the state is operating in relationship to all of this. Because you know, Marx tends to treat it as an institutional framework which is just supporting the market and that is that. So that's a whole kind of one. And the other, I, I said, is, is, is indeed the whole kind of sphere of social reproduction. I think the way I put it was to say, you know, the birth of a working child, class child, <laughs> and you have to think about everything that's involved in, 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 in all of that, uh, which is not covered here at all. Now Marx's position on that in capital is simply that the capitalists uh, pay the worker a wage, and the way he puts it in volume one of capital, and then says, and then, I, then the capitalist leaves it to the ingenuity. Of the, of, of the working classes to figure out how to survive on that wage, and, and the questions of social reproduction are their business and you know, their responsibility. Now, of course, what's happened over time is, is uh, increasingly uh, some of those questions of social reproduction have been sort of uh, pushed onto capital, so capital has to absorb some of those costs. And one of my interpretations of neoliberalism these days is precisely that what the capitalists are trying to do is to externalize all those costs of social reproduction to take us back into volume one of capital in which capital says basically to workers, here's your wage, and by the way, we're going to lower it as much as we can. Now you figure out how to, how to pay for your health care and your, you know, looking after the sick people and the maimed and this kind of stuff. So, yeah, there's no theory of social reproduction here, and it is indeed one of, the, one of the big issues, again, about the totality, which would have to be much better integrated uh, in, in, into the argument if you, wanted, if you wanted a theory of history and historical transformation. 
But my point is that Marx is not actually in capital trying to construct a theory of history. What he's trying to do is to actually create an alternative political economy. And that, that reminds me of one other thing, which is a bit which is totally aside of what you're saying. One of the things that happens in volume two is I have a very hard time seeing Hegel in here. I really do. I mean, Hegel is there in volume one, and it comes out very, all, all sorts of ways. But in volume two, I, I, don't, I don't see it. And, and actually something, you know, one of, one of the aspects in volume one which is, I think, uh, significant is there is, is unquestionably in volume one a tendency to be a bit teleological. You know, so you end volume one with the, you know, the expropriated are going to be expropriated and we're all going to sort of, you know, transition into a socialist paradise kind of thing. There's that and there's a certain teleological sense in which uh, factory is going to drive out all other forms and so, so there's, a, there's no question there's a teleological, the teleological elements in volume one, but again I don't see any in volume two. And I, don't, and I don't see Hegel, you know, and it's kind of interesting. In the Grundrisse, for example, Hegel's all over the place. Uh, he's, he's, he's significantly there in volume one, but he's, by, by the time you get to volume two he's pretty much disappeared, as far as I can tell. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm missing something. I'm sure somebody will come along and, 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 and provide a good Hegelian analysis of, of, uh, of volume two at some point. But it's very important to understand that Marx is not writing a theory of history, and particularly in volume two I think it's not a theory of history at all. Yeah? It's not just the case, I think, that, I mean, that Capital's been trying to offset that to the working class for the last few decades or so, but also it's uh, it's a necessity of capital to produce certain types of workers, so at certain skill levels and a certain geographic distribution and, and class and race and gender divisions and things like that. And so it's not just a matter of, I don't think all of that work gets done just in the realm of singularity, yeah. but there, you know, and so that's why I was sort of saying that there's this like, yeah. to understand you know, and like, for example, the university is a, a major site of, of how those divisions in, yeah. you know, get, get produced and how, how specific types of workers get produced. And so, right. so it's not just in that realm of consumption, but there's something else going on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's, that's right. And again, I think that has to be uh, taken up and, and, and integrated with the analysis. Yeah, Jen. Uh, about the social reproduction, if you, if you read, for instance, Alpicer's, um, little essay, Ideology and Ideological State of Practices, he starts out with a pro problem of reproduction, and then he's arguing, but this society has not needs to be reproduced not only economically, but also ideologically, and what is needed for that ideological reproduction, and from that perspective of reproduction, he develops his, his, his concept of ideological state of practice and, and ideological subjection. And I think this is a good example to, to get a hold on an, on, on, um, on an aspect that is missing in capital. Marx was not interested in capital at least. He was interested in German ideology, but not in capital. Right, right. Uh, and I just say it's, it's really working systematically uh, from the perspective of reproduction on, on that subject. Yeah, sorry you wanted to... The state is mentioned maybe only a handful of times in, in volume two, and I think once he refers to it, it could, act, it could act as an industrial capitalist relative to infrastructure investment, and then you mentioned it as a, the central bank as a pivot for the credit system. But um, that leaves a lot unexplained, so I was just wondering how do we think about the state relative to uh, much of what we've been reading in the well, I think one of the first things you do is, is uh, in my reading of, of, of Marx, uh, you have to s disaggregate the state, so you don't see it as a mon monolithic entity that does things. Uh, clearly, uh, when you look at the chapter on money in Volume 1, and you look at uh, the stuff uh, on finance and money in Volume 3, uh, the state management of the money is, is one of its big 
issues. And as we see from things like uh, central banks and all the rest of it, it's, it's very important that that be kept out of the rest of the state. So you get what I would call a kind of a state finance nexus. The best way to look at it is it's like the relationship between the U.S. Treasury and the, and the Federal Reserve. I mean, the U.S. Treasury is a different, is, is a part of the state apparatus, but it's, but it's shielded from pretty much everything else. It tends to get shielded from political influence, and of course the central banks are uh, I independent of congressional control. When you're thinking about the state, you have to start to disaggregate that part of the state which is playing this crucial function of managing the money system. Uh, and of course the state policy then becomes significant. And if you remember the stuff uh, on the credit system in Volume 3, Marx is very emphatic about what he considers the mistaken Bank Act of 1844. That is, the state created a central bank with certain kind of requirements, but those requirements were dysfunctional in relationship to the circulation of free circulation of capital and had to be suspended in the middle of the crisis. So state policy with, in relationship to monetary system is, is a very crucial aspect. I mean, in our situation, that part of the state is completely different from, say, housing and urban development or education or, you know, healthcare or anything like that, you know. I mean, that's, those parts of the state are, are, are fully politicized and caught up in democratic kind of struggles over this and that and that and this. So it's, uh, so, so I, I think you have to think about the state as, as different sets of institutions which sometimes conflict with each other. I mean, the, the typical thing you'll see from cabinet ministers' memoirs in Britain, for example, is that somebody will say, well, we had this great plan to do this and this and this, and then the Treasury Secretary said, you know, Chancellor of the Exchequer said, no, we don't have the money to do it, it's too expensive, stop it. So usually the Treasury has a, has a veto power uh, on a lot of stuff. So, so, so when you're analyzing the state, I think the first thing you do is to disaggregate it and then kind of sort of talk about various, as various aspects of it. Um, and then there's a part of the state which is about regulatory apparatuses. Uh, and it's, this is handled by Marx a bit, I think very interestingly, particularly around the question of the Factory Acts. And one of the things that Marx points out, that the Factory Acts were advantageous to big capital. Because small capitalists couldn't uh, pay um, all the investments that are needed to, to do it. So, so big capital sometimes supported regulation because it drove the small ones out of business and left them, you know, just in monopoly power. And there's been a long history of kind of regulatory capture you know, the sort of K Street interests that capture the regulatory agencies, and we, what we saw is the bank, the financial interest captured a lot of the regulatory apparatuses, and they did it directly and indirectly. One of the indirect ways in which they did it was, uh, you know, they knew that people in the regulatory apparatuses were not getting paid very much, and so they basically say to them, well, you know, you give us the right kinds of decisions for the next three years, and then we'll hire you here at twice the salary. And so, actually, what you see is a tremendous kind of regulatory kind of capture. So, so the state has to, has to be looked at in all these different uh, dimensions. So rather than thinking of it as a, a monolithic thing that does something, think of it as, as these different activities which are integrated with uh, the economy. And some of them are, are also involved in, in production of infrastructures, for example. And then, of course, there's the military side of things, which is another aspect of it, which is also embedded in the economy in certain ways. So you have to start to look at what the positionality of the different uh, works of the state are. Yeah. The two ideas of, of history, if one is teleological, one isn't, um, seem to be sort of incommensurable with each other. And I was trying to, so, but I mean, um, 
he, he's quite specific, like volume one, I mean, you have, uh, it's from the standpoint of production, right? And volume two, it's from the standpoint of circulation and exchange. And do you think that this maybe admits of um, multiple generalities? For instance, like we can have one set of generalities that gives us one sort of picture of a teleological history in volume one, but from a different standpoint, even though we're looking at the same universal process, we can have equiprimordial generalities that give us different sort of laws, one being teleological and the other from the standpoint of circulation, sort of, um, as Rose, you know, you brought up yeah. Rosa Luxemburg's criticism where it doesn't appear that there's a problem here. Right. Just on, in terms of what the texts are doing, uh, there is this teleological push in, in, in volume, volume 1, which reappears in Volume 3, particularly around the idea of falling rate of profit and issues of that kind. Uh, but I, I, the, the teleology really disappears here. But what you do get here is, of course, multiple places where the, of, of potentialities for breakdown or disruptions of some kind. So what, what it seems to me is there is a, 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 a theory of, of crisis generation in here, including in the reproduction schemas, that they, they can't possibly work, therefore we're going to get disproportionalities and we're going to get crises. Which presumably then would, would provide, well he doesn't say this, but presumably would provide many opportunities for agitation for people to say this system needs to be replaced. And several times in volume two he kind of says, well, if you were in a socialist system or if you were working, so we wouldn't have all of this kind of disruption and, 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 and pain and heartache that goes with these disruptions. So there is a, a plea, if you like, in volume two for an alternative system. But it's not embedded in the idea that somehow or other history is moving inevitably into that direction. It says there's multiple opportunities here of breakdown, and, and then I, I assume he's, he's saying, look, uh, it, it, it depends a little bit on when people get fed up with all of these breakdowns and disruptions and kind of say, hey, let's do something different. But that then depends very much on, on, on the social force which is going to, going to, going to make that, that happen. Because I don't see in, in volume two any inevitable move. I mean, he, he's, he's making a plea saying a socialist system would be much more rational and sensible than this, this, this stuff. But, but there's no kind of inevitability about the system itself will, will, will drive you towards socialism here. Whereas at the end of volume one, you do get that notion, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's coming. And in volume three, certainly in the first part of volume three, you get the idea that something's coming, though he hedges his bets a lot in volume three by kind of saying, well, but there are a lot of counteracting forces that could in fact uh, offset this. Yeah. Would you say that there is a necessity to bridge the theoretical gap between what Marx is trying to explain in volume two with the logic of class struggle that's expressed in his French works? I think uh, there has to be uh, uh, some way of, of putting them together. That uh, and and to some degree, you know, I I don't I, I don't think I was conscious I was doing it at the time. But when I did the study on Paris, which really spread that period from you know the 18th Brumaire to the class struggles, what I did was to ask the question: In what ways can I take the general general principles that Marx is talking about, which include, of course time-space reorganization of the French economy and the interior of Paris through the building of the boulevards, all those kinds of things, and investment in fixed infrastructures, all that sort of stuff. To what degree could you actually start to look at the differences between the revolution of 1848 and the uprising of the Commune as differences which are coming out of the transformation of Parisian society over that 20-odd you know, uh, year period? So I think there is a way of, of, uh, of bridging it, um, but in order to do that you, you can't sort of stuff Paris history into the laws of generality. You've, you've got to do something else with it. And, and, and in fact, I had to, had to use a lot of stuff about finance capital. I had to use a lot of stuff about the maximization of land rent. 
because uh, in effect the working classes were being expelled from the centre of Paris, partly by uh, expropriations and renewals, you know, sort of eminent domain type thing, but the other much bigger force was rising land rents, which were then forcing them out into the periphery. So part of the antagonism that was emerging in Paris was that, that working classes were being forced out from the centre to the periphery and they had long commutes and all this kind of stuff. And the, for a number of particular reasons, there was uh, during the 1820s and 1830s, uh, there was a very particular structure in Paris, which was that uh, there was Paris and then there was the, uh, the walls around it. And things were regulated inside of Paris, but outside of the barriers, things were not regulated. So there you've got all kinds of drinking establishments with no taxes and all this kind of stuff. So working classes on f feast days and the weekends would go out beyond the barriers of Paris to get you know, absolutely smashed out of their minds. And then there was, famously, they would come back into town, uh, usually raucous and drunk, and, and, and uh, so there came these festival-type things of, uh, and in fact this turns into whole weeks of, of uh, you know, crazy festivals outside of the barriers and, and it was called the descent from the outside into reoccupying the centre of Paris. So this began to happen at the end of the 1860s, before the Commune, that uh, a lot of working class people who'd been forced to live beyond the barriers now because land rents were rising were starting to come back and, 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 and have big demonstrations coming back into the centre. So the reappropriation of the centre, that people wanted to reappropriate the city they'd built. Uh, and, and, and they built it and they were kind of saying, it belongs to us, it doesn't belong to the bourgeois, they're living in it, and we made it, and they're living in it, and so we want, you know, we want, our, we want it back, kind of thing. So there's a lot of that sort of sentiment that, that, that went on. So you could, you could see some of the structures that, that you could derive from the world of generality, you could see some of the structures which played a very important role in the dynamics of what happened in 1871, which were different from what happened in 1848, because in 1848 the workers were in the centre of the city. By the time you get to 1871 they'd been expelled from the city. So 1871 is about the reoccupation of the city in the way that 1848 was not. So there is a way of, of looking at this. But again, you have to do the kind of work to put, to put it all together. So as a student of theology, I'm particularly interested in what difference it's made that you've been teaching Capital Volume 2 here at Union Theological Seminary um, versus being at the CUNY Graduate Center where you typically teach. And what, if any difference, has it made that you've been teaching at a religious institution versus at a secular institution? It's been a great opportunity for me. I mean, I, I, I really have enjoyed it, so I, I want to I wanna thank uh, everybody around here for being such wonderful hosts. And, and, and I think that having it in a theological seminary it does have a, a certain kind of different atmospherics to it. The questions of justice, rich and poor, and all those kinds of issues. And here you have the, the Poverty Initiative, which I know you're connected to and part of. And this seems to me a very interesting point of overlap. Uh, historically, um, various times, in, particularly in Latin America, I, I became exposed quite a lot to liberation theology and, uh, and I, I, find, I find that overlap uh, extremely, extremely significant and I think a lot of the revolutionary movements that have occurred in Latin America have been inspired by, by a theology of liberation and I have great admiration for many of those people who are, have been uh, involved in that. I talked once with Ernesto Cardinal who was a, 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 a priest there who became very much uh, connected to the Sandinista movement, and I always remember him um, being asked by an American journalist, you know, what made you a Marxist? And he said, I read the Gospels. <laughs> I thought this, oh, this was a wonderful kind of, kind of, kind of thing. So I think the, the, the sense of connectivity there is, is, uh, is, is very, very important, and I don't think, um, I mean, Marx made some Ne very negative remarks about religion, but given the nature of organized religion at the time, I perfectly understood why he would make those remarks, but I think that there's absolutely no reason why 
there cannot be a great deal of overlap between what you know, secular Marxists are interested in doing and what, what comes out from a theological perspective. I would just like to say some words from the perspective of Union Theological Seminary. We are very grateful that you could do this lecture here. We are glad that we were able to host this lecture here at Union Theological Seminary. And uh, personally, I hope that this can be done again when you are doing your lecture on Capital Volume 3. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, some people have been trying to pressure me to do the Grundary, sir, as well, which is even worse. <laughs> Should be even worse, but, uh, I, but I, I, I really want to thank you guys for having me here. It's been terrific. And it's uh, good to uh, be able to talk with a different audience. And so thanks for laying it on. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so who else has some questions? Annie, you have some. I still have two questions. We kind of got to one of them a little bit earlier, um, thinking about how um, Marx is reminding us about how crisis-prone capitalism inherently is. Um, and, and while there isn't as much of a teleological sort of like the system is doing the thing in volume two, um, we do get the sense that it might implode on itself. Um, and in talks I've heard you say, it's not going to fall on its own. It will need to be pushed. And I guess we got to that a little bit in you talking about sort of the conditions being right. But I guess I wanted to hear maybe more of your thoughts about what it being pushed might look like in the world of David Harvey. So, um, and then also thinking about um, <coughs> capitalism as a totality. Like we hear in volume two, um, that the capitalist mode of production tends to supplant, once it takes root, it tends to supplant and replace all other modes of production. Um, and then in the sections we've read from volume three, we learn that it's not just the mode of production, but the mode of social relations that get supplanted. Um, and thinking about some of the interventions that feminist Marxists have made um, in suggesting that perhaps it's important not to think of capitalism as an overarching totality that dominates everything, um, but kind of taking note of where there are non-capitalist modes of relation that are currently amongst us um, might be important for theorizing and acting a way out from under capitalism. I just wondered if you had thoughts about that. The language of domination, that, that capital dominates everything. I don't think that's what Marx, how Marx is construing capital at all. So I think there is a tendency to misread Marx precisely around the question of uh, is it dominating me because I like English marmalade? <laughs> and the answer is no, it's not. Uh, that that uh, uh, there's plenty of room for individual initiative, uh, there's plenty of room for all kinds of forms of association. Uh, there, are, there are multiple forms, and I think just, just to give you, go back to this framework for a minute, what this would say is that within the dynamics of capitalism, uh, a great deal of diversity is possible. For example, in the global economy you could have a sort of an authoritarian dictatorship like in Chile, which coexists with a very social democratic left-leaning government in Sweden. And there's nothing in Marx that kind of says, well, you can't, that can't happen. In fact, precisely about saying in the realm of particularity all kinds of different formation forms are possible. I think there's a misreading of, of Marx's understanding of capital and what the understanding of capital is when, if you say it dominates everything and there's only one answer. Uh, in fact, uh, it seems to be what Marx is saying is that there's a lot of opportunity for individual initiative, for people to do, do different things, and social relations, which are, which are not based on, you, you know, class uh, and all the rest of it, that th these things can exist in all sorts of uh, different ways. As long as they're all organized in such a way that they don't push you over the cliff. <laughs> and, and so the big question in Marx is where, is, where is the economic cliff over which you cannot go without crashing?
And, and I think that uh, this, is, this is, if you like, how I, I read it, and I think you know, that's what's coming up a lot in volume two, is where are the blockages, the hitches the, 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 in, in the system. So I, I don't, I don't make, you know, I find myself sometimes dismissed by some people kind of saying, well, you're just about capital is dominating everything. But I would kind of say, but, you know, there's a sense in which everything which goes on is, is going on in a context in which capital accumulation is going on. And, and you, you cannot step outside of that uh, and, and uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things and you may contribute to somebody else accumulating capital or you may not, and there are all kinds of, you know, sort of possibilities. So I think that um, the idea that the theory of capital, uh, which is being laid out here, is, is all there is, is, is just, I mean, precisely this framework of sort of saying those universal, general, particular and singular, is, is to say, you know, we have to look at the way in which all of these elements work together. And the, uh, the question of, of non-capitalist social relations, well, depending upon how you identify that, uh, they've been around for a very, very, all the time. And uh, the only interesting question is how those social relations uh, get set up and constructed in and around a society where capital accumulation is going on. And, and there are, however, uh, constraints. Uh, if, every, if everybody decided to behave in a completely non-capitalistic manner, then pretty soon uh, we find ourselves starving. Because right now, the stream of goods through which we live our daily lives is coming through a capitalistically organized system. And so, one of the big issues that uh, arises is how to organize the production of goods and services and all the rest of it in a non-capitalistic way so that we are, you know, still can exist. And, and uh, I, I think that that is, that is one of the pressing issues. Now, the, que the question of uh, whether, you know, who's going to push it, well, you know, that's your, that's your, that's your task. <laughs> you know, that's what you've got to think about. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, I think, I think the, the whole kind of question of anti-capitalist organization has to be put clearly on the agenda as to what an anti-capitalist organization will look like and how it will work. And, and uh, the, what the dynamic uh, is likely to be. Now, unfortunately, we've, we've, what's, what's been happening is, uh, we're com at least I find myself confronted with what I, I often call a, a sort of a fetishism of organizational form. That certain organizational forms are acceptable and certain are not. And then if you ask questions like, uh, well, in what ways does this organizational form actually allow you to confront the nature of the problem of reorganizing production and consumption in such a way that uh, what we're now talking about 10 billion people on planet Earth in the next 30, 40 years, how, how is that going to be done? And when somebody tells you, just because you say, well, you've got to, you, you've got to take over the state or something like that, they, kind of, they say, I mean, I, every time I say that, people say, well, you're a Leninist, aren't you? And I say, no, I'm not a Leninist. I, but, I mean, Lenin might have some more important things to say, but this idea that somehow or other you shouldn't, you shouldn't have anything to do with the state, for example. And you kind of go, well, all right, let's, 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 let's not have a state. How are we going to coordinate certain things? What forms of coordination are going to exist over sort of, uh, uh, you know, things like air traffic control? Okay? I mean, seriously. I mean, if, 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 it, if it becomes uh, entirely, uh, you know, sort of, uh, whoever gets there first and, you know, all, the, all of the planes are rushing to sort of get on the tarmac as soon as they can and push each other out of the, I mean, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of capitalism is about organisation. Uh, 
And that organization is usually constructed in some way or other through something like a state, whether it's a state or a state apparatus or, or, or a quasi-state organization, a regulatory organization. So how is that going to be done? Or you can either say, well, I don't like the fact that you have air traffic controllers in a hierarchical condition and so who, who are telling you people what to do, so therefore we won't, we won't have air traffic. You know. So we'll give up flying airplanes, which will be very good for the environment. And then you say, okay, fine, we'll all live without airplanes. And then you kind of say, well, but actually look at how much commodity transfer is going on through, you know. So you have to start to think about organizational form, and I think the main thing that, that does come out, I mean, this is why the, these reproduction schemas at the end are very important, which we were talking about last time, is, is how, how, do, how do aggregate decisions get put together in such a way that actually the totality makes some sense? And people don't like talking about totalities anymore. So we have a political environment in which much of the left doesn't want to talk about the state or anything like the state. And we have a political environment in which people don't want to talk about totalities. Okay. And it, it seems to me those are the things that Marx is talking about and that Marx leads us to. And of course then people say, well you're an old-fashioned dinosaur Marxist because you want to talk about those things. And I'm saying, well, you know, try and live in a world without them and see what happens. So uh, I, I think there's, 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 a, there's a lot of kind of thinking on the left in terms of what, you know, what kinds of organizational forms uh, can actually take on the task of, of, of organizing production and consumption and distribution in such a way uh, that we have a much more egalitarian uh, material base to, to social life. And, and, uh, we then, and, have to th and then we have to think through things like, well, how will money function? I mean, I had somebody write to me the other day sort of complaining that I had an article in The Independent and say, how can you publish in a capitalist newspaper? <laughs> and I thought, well, how can you publish it anywhere that's not <laughs> capitalist these days? I mean, so what do you do, not publish? <coughs> well, put it on the internet. Well, okay, all right, so But on the other hand, that's capitalistically organized in some ways too, so, you know and can, can be structured in some way. So I, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of issues here, and you know, obviously we don't have time to, to go into it in great detail, but I, I, I do think that one of, the, one of the questions which comes out of, I think, looking at the general laws of motion of capital as they're defined in Marx's capital, you're looking at a system which is actually, for all of its awfulness and all the rest of it, is still the basic means by which the world is fed, housed, clothed, and all the rest of it. And, and getting out of that means finding some other set of mechanisms that can you know, deliver us our clothing and our, our food and all the rest of it. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, issue. This is not to say that everything that needs to be discussed is discussed in capital. It's not. That's precisely the, my point, that Marx is writing an alternative political economy, not a theory of histo history or a theory of historical transformation. You can get some ideas about the theory of history and historical transformation from capital, but it is not in itself a theory of that. And, and, and if you appreciate Marx for what he's doing, as opposed to imagining that he's trying to, he's got a theory of everything, he hasn't got a theory of everything. I mean, and, 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 and I think by clearly understanding what he's got a theory of and what he's not got a theory of, we're in a much better position to appreciate what it is we can learn from Marx and at the same time what it is we have to do for ourselves and what other issues uh, we need to take up if we want to have a much more holistic understanding of how society works. I mean, there's no theory of uh, racialized capitalism in Marx, for example. Uh, and, and certainly, in, you know, if uh, somebody like uh, Steve Biko comes up with a notion of racialized capitalism as what South Africa is about, I think it's a perfectly appropriate way to look at it. You know, and this is a very specific way in which capitalism has developed, as it has also in this country. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's not a racialized capitalism in the same way in Ireland, say, uh, or in Spain. Uh, you know, it's 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 so so we really have to think about. 
you know, how, how, how to take this in, in different situations. And my, my point about sort of saying, well, Chile and Sweden can exist, coexist, but what, how can they coexist? What do they have to do to coexist? They have to have an organization that can produce sufficient surplus value in those two contexts, that they can survive competitively in a capitalist system. And situations do arise in which one part of the world figures out a better way to create surplus value than another part of the world. If we were having this class in the 1980s, we would have been looking at West Germany and we would have been looking at Japan as the two places that had figured out a way to create surplus value, and everybody's saying, we've got to copy them. Uh, and now we've got China. So now everybody's kind of saying, we've got to, the Chinese figured it out, you know, better than we have, so we've got to copy China. Uh, so, so, but, the, but notice that. The rule is, you've got to produce surplus value. And that's why, I, again, that passage of the Grundrisse where Marx kind of says, production dominates over the other, predominates over the other moments. It's production of surplus value. And if a society and, and, uh, is not producing surplus value, then you get driven out of competition. And you see what happens to societies which are not very, haven't been very good at, at producing surplus value. Uh, look at what's happening to Greece. Or look what's happening uh, you know, to Ireland. Although in the Irish case it's very interesting, they are quite good at producing surplus value. And the, it's just that the craziness of the property market just took it over the edge into, into in huge indebtedness. So I, I, so I, I I think that there are many aspects that need to be elaborated upon, you know, in, in, in a complementary way to what Marx has to say, but if you understand what Marx has to say, Marx isn't saying this dominates everything. Although there is a lot of domination going on, I think, uh, you know, Jan mentioned the ideological state apparatus and the reproduction of ideology. I mean, I wish people who kind of said, oh, everything's free, you can think what you like, you know, and you can publish what you like, and you kind of go, well, how come I can't get published in any American newspaper, you know? I mean, I can get in the British press, but I can't get in the American. Why not? Well, because ideological apparatus won't let you. Yeah, you might be. Uh, I just want to go back a little bit to the question of critique of political economy and, uh, and uh, theory of history uh, to talk about imperialism. In, in, in this article you distributed to us a couple of weeks ago, The Geography of Capitalist Accumulation, you make the following statement. We have to bring theory to bear on existing situations within the structure of capitalist social relations at this point in history. We have to force an intersection between theoretical abstractions on the one hand and the materialist investigations of actual historical configurations on the other. To construct and reconstruct Marx's theory of accumulation on an expanding geographical scale as a totality requires such an intersection. And if I understand you correctly, Territorial boundaries, the competitive struggles between nation states, uh, inter imperialist rivalries, and even politics within states are crucial, crucial links of this integration of history and theory, since they are at least partially contingent outcomes that nonetheless are in some way rooted in the allocation theory that can be derived from Marxist theory of accumulation. Is that correct? And if it is, could you elaborate a little bit further on this link? Wow. <laughs> um, well, the, the, basic, the basic idea is this, that, that, that you know, capital, uh, is some, is, uh, capital accumulation occurs in space. That uh, production decisions are made about where do I locate. Frequently what happens is if firm one locates in a space, then the suppliers will likely locate in that space. Others will locate around it. So you get a collective space, agglomeration if you like. So you get cities, which are concentrated spaces or of, of, of productive activity. So if you take Marx's example, you know, you, you, you have a, a cotton manufacturers and you've got dyeing and you've got all of the other ancillary things and energy production. So capital is always about the production of space and within those spaces often there is a requirement for collective means of production. Sewers, water, roads, 
And then there's a question of how are those collective means of production produced? Who produces them? Well, in a company town, a, a, a corporation may produce them. But more frequently, the local state produces them, usually with some taxes from... So, so you get the production of space, of space, but you also get the production of territorial administrative apparatuses. Now, there's a sort of historical kind of thing in which states get, have, have, have existence for you know, historical kinds of reasons. My argument is if, the states, if states did not exist in any form whatsoever, capital would have to create something like states in order to meet its needs of collective means of production and, and also reproduction at a certain point, because at some point or other you've got to have working class housing and you've got to have all these other stuff. So there's a geography, dy geographical dynamic to that. And then what you see is that within, within this, this region, say, that they are producing goods of a certain kind and they're very often in competition with other regions that are producing goods of a, of, of a similar kind. You know, cotton has been being produced here, cotton goods are being produced here, and they're being produced over there. So that competition then leads to sort of uh, sometimes uh, political fights, and if you can use political power and at some point even military intervention to go dominate some other territorial space and you wipe out their industry, then you've got their market, which is basically what the British did to India. Uh, the British go into India and they uh, sort of destroy indigenous industries and then it becomes a huge market for the, the cotton goods being produced in Manchester. So, so you get something, you get a, a colonial relation, an imperial relation of some kind, which is connected to the way in which a political institution surrounds, if you like, a, a, a productive apparatus, which then uses the political institution to dominate another space in some way. So you get geopolitical rivalries which are going to come out anyway. And you'll see that even within countries. There are inter-urban rivalries, for example. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, Baltimore, Boston, Philadelphia were all c competing with each other for the trade to the West, and whoever got there first, you know, dominated. So, so you've got geopolitical rivalries, geographical competition going on all of the time. And when, you, when that starts to come into much larger configurations, and so you do get a state apparatus like the United States, and it's, then there's a big question, you know, how, uh, how are the industries inside of the United States uh, going to relate to the west, rest of the world economy? Well, one of the ways you can do that is by setting up uh, a kind of institutional arrangements. Uh, and usually the top dog in, in, in a situation says free trade for everybody. Because, you know, like the British did in the 19th century and the US has been doing through the WTO, and now it's kind of saying, oh my God, what have we done? Free trade, uh, the Chinese, and all that oh, way. Hey, maybe we should have protectionism again or something. So, so what, what happens is that you, you do get a, a, a geographical structure, an inevitable geographical structure to capital accumulation, which produces territorial, interterritorial competition, which can then at various points start to become militarized in, in the way that we often, often see and colonialized and all the rest of it. So, what I was arguing there was that you cannot see imperialism as something which is separate from this dynamic. Now, the dynamic of relation, the, the, the British state is formed at a certain historical moment, and it's very interesting to look at that historical moment because what happened was a state finance nexus formed in Britain under Henry VIII, and it's very clear that that's what happened. And that state finance nexus became a military finance state. And it then used its power for political purposes. In fact, it became mercantilist, and that's when you know, the British states started to support colonialism and imperialism of all the, all the sorts. So you get a, his, a very specific history, which is consistent with the locational requirements I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Now, locationally, I can't say from the theory that this space is going to defeat that space. This is all the contingent stuff, you know, who has the power, and a lot of it is accidental, and, and who has the resources and who does not. So there's a geography of capital accumulation, which uh, underpins, in my, in my view, uh, a lot of imperialist activities. 
And, and there's a great phrase by Woodrow Wilson, who, you know, he's a great liberal kind of figure. Woodrow Wilson kind of gives a speech and he kind of says, you know, uh, the job of the state is to follow wherever merchant capital goes and, 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 and to support where they go and if necessary to use military means to break down the Chinese walls that might be a barrier to their further going. I mean, so, you know, so the great humanist liberal was actually about liberalizing the world for, for US corporations, as was George Bush. I mean, when George Bush is, was talking about freedom and liberty in Iraq, it was about, you know, imposing upon Iraq uh, uh, an open door for capital accumulation, if you could possibly do it. It hasn't worked too well, but, you know, that was very much the idea. So my, my point is, is there that this is a very um, significant uh, way in which I could, I could see taking Marx's theory of accumulation, which is very temporal, and bring it to bear on Lenin's theory of, of imperialism, which is, which is not temporal so much as it is spatial. And what's the relationship between the temporal argument in you know, the teleological temporality of Marx and, and, and what's, what's the relationship between that? And what I did was to try to say I can, I can get at that through a theory of location and, 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 and competition and the coercive laws of competition in space. So that's, that's how I was really sort of putting it all, all together. Yeah. He's showing that there's, there's a class conflict going on in a, uh, any capitalist state because the state is owned by the, the wealthy, the people who own the means of production. So invariably a capitalist state cannot be democratic. It's the sense I get from it. Now, um, that, that inequality leads to, uh, you know, oppression because that comes from the very basis of capitalism itself being exploitative. Yeah. I don't see any, anything that's uh, humanitarian in any capitalist state that exists. There have been times when the capitalist state has been clearly influenced by working class interests to the point where certain structures of, around, for instance, social reproduction uh, have been implemented. And the same would also be true of a capitalist state being influenced uh, by recognition that uh, you need to take care of uh, environmental degradation and so on. So there are, there are historical moments where the capitalist state has been, you know, more social democratic than, than not. Now, now that, is, that has very much gone on the back burner over the last 30 years. I mean the period after, but again the period after 1945 was in a context of, of course, the Cold War. And it was partly by, you know, we have to show that uh, uh, we can take care of some of the inequalities and we can do something for the people because there was this threat of communism. So there was a need, if you like, to do, do something. Uh, in relationship to that in, in that period. Now, it didn't apply to everybody, but uh, the social democratic state, the Scandinavian state, for example, was rel relatively benevolent in the distributive sense. And it's very interesting, Scandinavian socialism was about distributive socialism, not about production. It never socialized the means of production at all. So actually you had tremendous concentrations of wealth all, all throughout the whole Swedish democratic period tremendous concentrations of wealth in production, but there was a relatively equitable kind of distribution and social services and, and you know, education and, and egalitarianism and so on. So you do have some periods where, but the capitalist state does not automatically go that way. It goes there because there are certain, you know, political forces at work uh, and, and uh, they can force something towards more social democracy, which is sometimes, by the way, in the capitalist class interest, which gets back to the fact that you need sometimes an educated workforce, you need uh, a healthy workforce, and, and when Marx kind of says, even in the chapter on the working day, that there is a length of the working day which actually is, is so destructive towards labour that it's against capital's collective class interest to keep it going that way. 
so that actually control over the length of the working day is something which is actually advantageous to capital because uh, you can get higher productivity if you're only working people eight hours a day than if you're working them 20 hours a day. So there are historical moments when the capitalist state moves in certain directions. Now the whole history of the neoliberal period has been generally speaking to move in the other direction. And, and so you know, this is, uh, I think, you know, one of the things we're looking at in contemporary situation. Is this the end game of all of that? So we, now we're attacking the municipal unions and we're, you've got massive unemployment and we're forcing the wage rates down. Profit rates are very high right now, uh, mainly because labour is being squeezed very hard uh, pretty much all around the world and, and it's becoming um, you know, more and more and, and now we're seeing this kind of business of austerity cut all of the, the, the social services, uh, uh, cut all of the support for social reproduction. So, yeah, there's, but again, this is a, this is, these are historical trends and historical moments. Uh, and I think that, uh, you, you know, so you have to look again at the, that history as, as being partly constructed out of the dynamics of class struggle. But also, the laws of motion of capital have something to do with it. Did the welfare state uh, structures, uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s, and environmental regulation, were they beginning to actually interfere with the dynamics of, of production of surplus value? And I think the evidence probably is that they were. And it was at that point that capital had to go on the counterattack in order to survive. And they went very effectively on the counterattack. And they've been counterattacking ever since to the point where, you know, we're now where, where we are. But somebody else had a, had a question, yeah. Uh, chapter 17, the circulation of surplus value. You indicated that Marx's sort of adherence to viewing this through, through only two classes led him to a sort of absurd conclusion about, um, you know, the, the, the uh, 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 bourgeoisie was, you know, the funding at both ends and had to spend their own money to realize their surplus value. Anyway, I was wondering if you had any further comments on how class appears mm -hmm. in uh, Volume 2, uh, particularly in light of the, uh, if it, one of the major themes of Volume 2, it seems to be, is the contradiction there seems to be a contradiction between the, uh, the sort of incentives of individual capitalists and their roles, maybe productive capital, merchant capital, finance capital, and what's productive for capital as a whole, which is where you can see, you know, if you have the glut of finance capital, then nothing gets produced, this, that, or the other. Right. Um, I just wondered if you had any more general comments on, uh, on maybe, first of all, his strict adherence in the generality to two classes, and whether if you sort of expanded that, that would get you to particularity, and uh, particularly the relation between sort of capitalist classes. Well, I think it does look very different when you get out of a two-class, a simple two-class model. Um, I mean, in, in practice, I would, I would argue that the question of where does the extra money come from to buy the surplus? Uh, the only answer Marx can give, given the framework of volume two, is, well, since the workers can't do it, the only other class that can do it is the capitalist. So you get that answer. Now, there are two things there. First is, historically, would that be true? And there are two possible other ways in which you could get the surplus. One was, as I mentioned, the residual wealth of the feudal classes, who are consumers. Uh, and the other is through the imperialism, Rosa Luxemburg solution. So historically, there's been other options. The question then, however, would be if Marx, if we take Marx and sort of say, all right, relations with pre capitalist form formations are no longer able to do that and imperialism is, is, has gone, how then can this be done? And there I think the two class model is helpful in the sense that what it says is that a mechanism has to be found whereby the bourgeoisie through its decision-making apparatus, can somehow or other realize the surplus value that it is organized, that it, the, the production of. And how does it do that? Now, Marx's answer here is largely through their personal consumption, that they go out and they eat like crazy and they spend a lot of money and all the rest of it. But I think this is, you know, this is too restricted, too restrictive. The other possibility is that it is, it is through the, the, the bourgeoisie organizing productive consumption, i.e. the expansion of the system, which says that the surplus from yesterday is consumed by the expansion of the system tomorrow. 
uh, which is reinvestment. So reinvestment becomes an expansion of the system, becomes absolutely necessary for the system. So if there was no reinvestment, there would be almost no way in which, in, a, in that two-class model, you could actually account for where the surplus is coming from. Now, if this argument I'm making, that it's, that it's going to be um, productive consumption in the next round of reinvestment, there's a time gap between the production of the value yesterday and the beginning of the, of the production tomorrow, which of course is where the credit system comes in again. That therefore speculative capital has to come in and buy up, as it were, yesterday's output, surplus output, the surplus value produced yesterday. And then it has to take it and put it into production with the idea it's going to produce even more surplus value beyond that. Now, when you, when you go that way, you then get, if you like, the logic of the capitalist system is not about the capitalists simply consuming their surplus by having a good time and all the rest of it. It's, it's about the constant, uh, uh, if you like, expansion of their own wealth and power. Right? Which, given some of the motivations which are discussed in Volume 1, like, like the fact that, that money is a form of social power which can appropriate by private persons and therefore the lust for that private power, that power is there, then the logic of the system makes much more sense. Of the continual expansion is, is necessary for the, for the expansion that's already occurred, but also that continuous expansion is, is pushing towards exactly what you were talking about, which is the increasing concentration of immense wealth and power in the hands of the bourgeoisie, to the point where they actually become a plutocracy, which is pretty much what what we've got right now. It seems that you have two different arguments then, with one in volume one and one in volume two, as to where that constant expansion comes yes. from. Volume yes. one being the competition between capitalists and volume two, yes. you're saying here, as far as capitalism. Yes. The logic of volume two, to me, uh, uh, I mean, the, the competitive, coercive laws of competition which push this in volume one are significant and important. Um, but I think this logic in volume two is also Im Im important. If you put the two together, you, you see immediately that the coercive laws of competition are going to force you to expand anyway, even if you don't have a lust for, for, for more wealth and power. So that actually by putting the two together you get a bit of sense as to why this is a system that is, you know, as I argue, perpetually committed to at least a 3% minimum compound rate of growth forever. You know, and, why, and why it must necessarily expand, Other, if it doesn't expand it's, it, it's, it's finished. So it, you, you get the logic of perpetual expansion, which is a teleological sort of argument in a way, but it, it then has a base. It's not a, it's not a kind of a, you know, something which is the, you know, the, the I nearly said the Holy Spirit comes to earth, but yeah. <laughs> the Hegelian spirit comes to earth <laughs> and, 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 and drives the thing on. It's, it, it's more like there's an internal logic within capital that says it's a, of this sort, and I think that to me that was one of the interesting things, is to think about the logic, of the relationship between the coercive laws of competition in Volume 1, which drive the expansion, and what gets driven in Volume 2, which is the necessity of finding a market for what you produced yesterday by expanding tomorrow. And those two go side by side. The, the, in, in effect, the first argument about coercive laws of competition is much easier to understand. People can get that. It's very hard to get this second one which is coming out here, which is why it seems so peculiar when Marx is sort of saying, well, the bourgeoisie actually absorbs its own surplus value. Well, why would it do that? Well, if it's just absorbing it in consumption, it's one thing. But if it's absorbing it in expansion, then, then, then this incredible kind of accumulation of wealth and power which is going on in the upper classes becomes absolutely critical for understanding the dynamics of the system. I think we should probably stop around now. Okay, and say thank you very much, and uh, it's been a great time, and thank you.